um, so that you can see the cat just as we're about to start our service. And uh, I did last week. So there we are. And then I can open the presentation, can't I? Mm -hmm. Uh, here we go. Got the screen I don't know. Here we go. Where we're That's it. All right. Okay, so we are just about, it's about 11.30 at the moment, and we would like to say welcome to everybody and thank you very much for joining us today in our service. I think we all uh, need to mute, Jimmy. Yeah. That's what I'm mute. just about to ask that oh, okay. everybody will please mute. I think what I will do is I will find Paul Tonkins and make him co-host because he's going to uh, share. I see Dawn. Nice to see you this morning and I like your hat as well. So oh, lovely. Lovely to see you, Dawn. <laughs> so make Paul Tonkins co-host. So, Paul, whenever you're going to be sharing with us, then you can easily share your screen and so on. Um, okay, so we would like to say welcome to everybody and thank you very much for muting. Um, and later on, when the song comes up, then you're welcome to sing as loudly as you possibly can. Uh, if you want to <laughs> unmute and let us know, then you can do that. But I would suggest that, um, uh, you know, we all keep it muted and we sing along and, and that will make a lot more sense. We would like to say also welcome to everybody who's joined us on, on YouTube, which is uh, outside of our Zoom meeting. And uh, may the Lord bless you also as we spend this time together today. Um, so this is our family worship for, um, for, 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 for this day. Um, instead of having uh, someone telling us a story today, we are going to have a video by the young people of our two churches, something that Sedrina has put together, but because in the past almost a year, Sedrina has done quite a bit of work with the young people in their Sabbath school class, and we thought um, uh, it speaks to us so much that we would love to share some of that with you and that you can, um, you know, see the beautiful things that the young people has done. So just before we do that, I'm just going to uh, ask you all to pray with me as we just do an opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we have this wonderful time to worship you together today as a church. And we're in different places and um, different homes, and we, we just long to be together physically again. But until then, we have to do it like this. And we thank you that we have the opportunity to share with one another in the way that we do. We ask your presence in everything we do today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yes, so, okay, now let's see. Um, I'm hoping this video will work. And uh, so everyone can have a nice listen. There we go. Thank <laughs> you. 
My name is Nicole Mpandi, and I'm going to be talking about Jesus. He had enemies as well, and he didn't. He treated them like he treated everyone else, kind, and he had all the fruit of the spirit. Call for my servant. Yes, sire. You you owe me a lot of money. Oh, well, sorry, sire. Please forgive me. Okay, I shall forgive you. Few moments later, call for my coworker. Yes, sir. You owe me some money. Oh, sorry, sir. Please forgive me. Uh, I need to uh, help get more money. You owe me a lot of money, and I want it now. Sorry, sir. Please forgive me. I'm going to throw you in jail. No, sir, please. Then the king calls for him. Call for my servant. Yes, sire? You put your friend in jail, and he just owed you a little money. Yeah, you owed me so much money, and I still I, and I still forgave you. So you are going to go in jail. So this was our little testimony from our PowerPoint. Class. <clears throat> so your pivot. Who's not muted? Can you all please mute? <clears throat> so yes, we usually have a testimony time. And this was a little testimony of what our young people in the PowerPoint class have presented this year. And we have um, been talking about all different themes. And each week, they have become even more confident in their loving friendship and relationship with God. And we hope that they will continue. So these are just little bits of what they've been able to share with each other, uh, whether it be through art, through music, through preparing and creating movies. Um, well, Jonas has really uh, come in doing his pivot art each story that we cover, he creates a story just like you've seen there and shares it with the class. And so they have really, even though we've not been able to get together, they've been sharing with each other and God is rich, richly blessed them. Mm. So I hope that um, you will be proud of them. And we hope to share many more things like this of what our children have been able to get up to during lockdown. So thank you for, for watching. And I'm sorry that there was a bit of a problem with uh, sound. And if you weren't able to hear Olivia's playing, we'll try and get this out into a, a different source of media where everybody will be able to, to hear and enjoy it. And maybe while you're just talking before, before you're gonna do the prayer, um, just tell everybody why we are wearing hats, because not everybody is, prob is probably aware of why we are wearing hats now. Yes. So again, for those who have just joined us on Zoom and those who are joining us on YouTube, um, th 
thank you for those who are wearing hats. Uh, we are wearing hats today because I'm taking you during our children's story today to a country where these become a necessity and it's got to do uh, with water. So that is why we are wearing hats today. So if you have a hat at home and you'd like to join us on that journey, then do feel free to wear one. And it's nice to see the hats that's everywhere. I'm just seeing new, new pictures of some of you that I haven't seen yet this morning. And it's so nice to see you. Thank you for doing that. Now, we're going to do an opening or a prayer. Um, and I'm going to ask Sadrine to just, uh, to just um, lead us in that prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for <clears throat> the amazing abilities that you have given to each of us, the talents that we have. And during this lockdown period where we've not been able to meet physically, to engage with each other, we thank you for our social media options where we can still use our talents to your glory. We thank you for these young people who are striving each week to do something different and to better themselves. We thank you for their parents who are supporting them. We thank you for our church families, both with Dundee and Creef. We thank you for the ministries that each one is involved in, whether it's helping those in our neighborhoods, whether it be ministering to our colleagues or schoolmates or in the universities where you lecture. Whatever your situation is, we Lord, we praise you and thank you for being there with each of us. And this morning, we dedicate our service to you. May the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us. May the message that is brought this morning touch each of our lives in the way that we need it to do. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, why am I? Okay. Um, thank you, Sidreen, and um, for the prayer. And... Just, it's time for the deacons to stand up, please, and um, to take your bags and go around. And for me to remind us all that um, the church does operate on, on money. And um, we say thank you so much to all of you. It's been very strange times. So the, the way in which we've taken up offerings over the last year has, has been very different than we've ever known it. And... Um, uh, and this is a reminder that tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow evening, we'll have both of the business meetings for the two churches, um, in which we will just also have a look at the budget for this coming year, and then we will vote them. But we would like to say thank you to everybody who's been so faithful and so generous with your offerings um, and your tithe throughout this past year. Um, and just to remind you that if you want to make offerings, um, which our churches both need to operate um, and so on, even though it's on a much lower scale, um, it is much appreciated and through the same ways, uh, the banking that you have. And we try to include those in the news, in the, in the emails that go out every Friday afternoon. So thank you, deacons. You can sit down again. And we have our scripture reading. And this morning... Riley is going to share with us. I've asked Sadrine, can you find us somebody from Dundee who is going to be doing our scripture reading? And that is from John chapter 4, verses 13 to 15. So let's listen to Riley. Happy Sabbath. Today I'm going to be reading John chapter 4, verses 13 to 15. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Thank you very much, Riley. That was beautifully done. We really do appreciate it. Um, now I think... We've, uh... Happy Sabbath. Oh, no. Be... <laughs> Riley wants to read again. Apologies for that. It's time for the prof. All right. So for those of you who are wearing your hats, step up because we are on a journey to a very far distant country. 
And this country is very hot. It has very dry weather, but it can also have quite rainy weather as well. And it's not South Africa, it's not Zimbabwe, but it is a place where you find these two animals that you see on your screen. Now, I'm aware that uh, Steve Peacock has <laughs> a hat all the way from Australia. And so, yes, you're coming on a journey to the country of Australia, where in their desert regions, there is a little mouse that you see on the top right hand side of your screen. Now, this little mouse, it's actually not a mouse, it's a rat, believe it or not. Now, rats are supposed to be these huge things, but this is called a kangaroo rat. It is the tiniest little creature that you can find in the desert. It has a very long tail, but that's not the most unique thing about this little animal. It is, or rodent, I should say, it has a unique quality to it. The kangaroo rat does not drink water. Did you hear that? It does not drink water. It survives on the seeds that it finds. When it eats the seeds, the moisture within the seed is the hydration for this little rat. But not only do we find that this kangaroo rat does not drink water, but we also, if you look at the koala bear, the koala bear is a marsupial that also doesn't drink water. In fact, it gets its moisture or its liquid from the, the moisture inside the eucalyptus plant. And so these two very unique animals can live in a very, very hot climate, and yet they don't need to drink water. So how is it that us as humans think that we can go without water? Well, let's go to our story for today. And our story comes from the book of John, where a Samaritan lady, who was of questionable character, had done some really bad things, hung out with the wrong type of people, comes in the heat of the day to the well to get some water for her, her family to take back. And here she encounters Jesus. And Jesus asks her for a drink of water. And I am feeling quite thirsty myself after having talked just a little bit. Mm. There's nothing like a drink of water to kind of wet the inside of your mouth when you are feeling either thirsty or just parched from using up a lot of saliva. And if you were in Australia or any of the hot countries that some of you may have visited, when you are out in that heat, your body releases a lot more sweat than what you normally would, and you can quickly become dehydrated. So water is essential. Can I have a sip? Yes, you Thank can you. have a sip. Unless, of course, you are the koala or the kangaroo rat. So here, this young lady, she asked, uh, she comes and Jesus asks her for a drink of water. And she, she, they have this conversation going back about what is it about water? And Jesus then introduces her to the idea of the water of life. He wasn't talking about the water that we need to survive. He was talking about his love, his way of life, that he was the answer to her thirst of knowledge. 
And so when Jesus comes into the story, he then presents another thing. He says, well, if you drink of my water that I can give you, if you accept me as your savior, then you won't be thirsty again. Well, let's see. Let's have another drink of water. This is the water that Jesus has. He says, no, if you want water, normal water, you don't need it. Not over the computer, please. You don't trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus' offer of eternal life is the best solution. We think our water is the way to keep alive. But let's listen carefully to Uncle Paul today to find out a little bit more about this message of the water that Jesus offers. Is it water that we keep needing to drink? Or is it water that when we accept it every single day, We won't need to keep feeling thirsty. So if you want to find out how that worked, send me a message and I'll share it with you. Blessings to all of you. Thank you for wearing your hats. Thank you. Well, I'm going to take mine off now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor. Um, it is now time for the sermon, and so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, I want to introduce to you that non, not that he needs any introduction, Pastor Paul Tompkins, who is the president of the Scottish Mission. And it's not Uncle Bob Rod that's on the screen. Oh, <laughs> <Did> <laughs> I... oh my goodness, let me stop share that immediately. <laughs> Um, we say thank you very much uh, to Pastor Paul for being here with us today, and um, we are anticipating a beautiful story from your end, um, and thank you so much for doing this. It's over to you, and you're welcome to just share whenever you need. Sorry, just had to unmute myself. Thank you very much indeed, Sadrine, and for the story, and for the uh, for the hats as well. Um, we're continuing in our theme of going through the book of John. And as you will have realized, uh, as from Riley's scripture reading and from Sadrine's story, we are now coming to uh, John chapter 4. So I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 4 while I'm just going to attempt to share the screen because I'm going to talk you through this with a PowerPoint. So let me see if I can get this done. And uh, funnily enough, I can't see what I need. So why can't I do that? Let me just go out of there. Oh, yes, I can, I think. Right, there we are. Okay, so let me just go to the beginning. All right, we're coming to the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. Now, we don't know her name, do we? Two people came to a well. One we know was a man, one was a woman. That's for sure. One was Jesus, but we don't know the name of the woman. Now, if I had to give a, a working title, I think I would give a title of Conversations with Jesus. And I want to introduce this by saying that there are some conversations that you never forget. And I suspect you and I have had them in uh, our lives. They may be a long time back in your childhood, or they may be um, recent as well. Now, I'm gonna share something here that a conversation I had. Now, I know I've shared this at Dundee some time back, but you may or may not remember uh, the actual words. Now, this happened to me. You see, way back, I've been in ministry now 40 years this year. Way back when, before I first started, when I left school, I took a business course. 
It was a sandwich course, as they used to call it in the old days. It was a, a, an HND, High National Diploma in Business Studies. You did two years in college, one year in industry. That's why it was called a sandwich course. So I completed the two years in college, and then I went out and had to work in industry. Now, I got a job, and you had to apply for the job. You had to go through interviews. And I got a job with a pensions firm. I know Sadreen works in the pensions industry. And Sadreen, I literally take my hat off to you. Now, on my very first day, I won't name the, the company, I turned up for work. I'd had an interview. I'd been accepted. They'd seen my qualifications. And on the very first day, I walked into the new building. And of course, I was wearing a smart suit, looking as neat and as fresh as I could. I would be in my early 20s, or I could have been about 20 at the time. Um, and so the, the, business, the, the, the boss took me into his office, sat me down, and he wrote on the blackboard. In those days, it was boards rather than uh, anything else. And he wrote these two sets of letters. And he turned to me and he said, do you know what they are, what they mean? Now, if you've heard the story, you will probably know. And I've never forgotten it because I sat there. And of course, I was discomforted because I didn't know. I began to sweat. And he knew that I would not know. But in the back of my mind, I wanted to be smart. I wanted to look uh, good. And I thought maybe I should have done my homework. Is there something I should know about this company that I don't know? Well, he'd written up RMA and WMA. And he looked at me and said, what does RMA stand for? Well, I hadn't got a clue. I thought it must be some pensions association or something like that. But I think so Dream will say, there's nothing in that background. And then he finally looked at me and said, RMA stands for, and if you've heard the story, right mental attitude. Then he asked me what WMA stands for, and you've all got there, you all know what it is. So what does WMA stand for? Wrong mental attitude. And he was giving me a pep talk at the very beginning. The pet talk was from that day forth, he wanted me in the uh, work for that firm to have the right mental attitude. Now, I've never forgotten that conversation. I long left the firm. In fact, I worked there six months. And I'm sorry, Sadreen, I realized the pension industry wasn't for me. And I moved on in working for health service administration. But I've always remembered the right mental attitude. And it spans time and place. It's well over 40 years ago, but we need the right mental attitude. And that will come into play in our story today. So a conversation with Jesus. Now, I actually believe this is the longest conversation recorded in the whole Bible between somebody and Jesus. I told you I've never forgotten the words of that um, that boss, that manager. Well, I wonder if the lady ever forgot the words of Jesus. I don't think she would have. She would always remember that day. I don't believe it was a chance meeting. I think Jesus went to the well because he intended to meet the woman. And there's a transferable principle here. Jesus sought her out. She did not come seeking Jesus but Jesus went to find the lady. Now, with your Bibles, open to John chapter four. And if at the beginning, it simply says, therefore, when Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made, uh, made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples, verse three, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. Now, as it said on the bottom of the screen, geography is important. There are three regions, Galilee in the north, Samaria in the middle, and Judea in the south. And I want to thank Hillary for doing this because Hillary uh, helped me put this together. Yes, a hot country. And there we have the, uh, the map. 
and you will see indeed Jerusalem in Judea and you will see Galilee at the top, Nazareth, Cana, Capernaum. If you want to go between A and B, you go through Samaria. But there's a problem. The Jews and the Samaritans are not best friends. Think about the Israelis and the Palestinians. It goes way, way, way back. It goes back to about 700 BC and um, when they were rebuilding Jerusalem and the Samaritans wanted to be involved, but through Ezra, they were told, no, you cannot be involved. It must be God's people. And ever since there was animosity. The Samaritans had their own temple built on Mount Gerizim, fallen into disrepute. The Jews had theirs in Jerusalem. Now, the question is, did Jesus have to go through Samaria? It says in verse 4, yeah, he needed to go through Samaria. It didn't say he had to. I'm reading from the uh, New King James Version. He needed, and yes, he did need. He wanted to meet, he wanted to meet the lady. But he could have taken another route. If you look at the map, and this is what many pious Jews did, because they did not want to meet Samaritans. They didn't want to converse with them. They didn't want to talk with them, trade with them or anything. They could have gone to the east or right, if you want to have a look at the map. They could have crossed uh, the Jordan into Perea, up into the Decapolis, across again the Jordan and into Galilee. It would have taken them out of their way, there is no question. But many would do that because they did not want to go through Samaria. But Jesus did. Not only did he disregard this, he wanted especially to go to Samaria because he wanted to meet this lady. And there's a, I, I guess there is a principle here. If you want to meet Samaritans, you've got to go to Samaria. Or put it the other way around, you've got to go to Samaria to meet Samaritans. If we want to find people, we've got to go to where they are. That's the actual principle. Now, there was going to be a number of barriers that Jesus was going to have to break down. And we're going to talk about this. But just before we get there, this is a conversation that is timeless, absolutely timeless. We may think it is so many years ago, 2000 years ago. But you know, the human heart stays the same. Yes, I understand times change, and they absolutely do. But I think we have today the same hopes, fears, dreams, and doubts, and struggle with the same problems as they did then, because we're humans. People struggle with relational difficulties, misguided actions, limited faith not seeing the right way forward, absolutely spot on to this day. And so Jesus made his way, and we're told he came to Sychar, or Sica, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. That's the background. Now Jesus was going to have to come through a number of difficulties. Now there's an interesting fact that you will read from the, um, the, uh, the, the passage if you go through. In verse 6 it says, Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore being wearied from his journey sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now there is some debate over what the hour would actually be. Um, we believe it was in uh, the hot time of day, and of course we're in a very hot country, hence the, the hats. I don't know if we ever picture Jesus wearing a hat, but there is the idea. I would certainly, being a pale skin, need to be wearing a hat. Most Bibles will say he came at noon time. Now it depends what time you're using, Roman time or Jewish time. But basically, uh, and if I read from the Desire of Ages, uh, there is the lovely chapter by Ellen White uh, on chapter 19 at Jacob's Well. And she simply says, the journey since morning had been long, and now the sun of noontide beat upon him, and his thirst increased. So this was a special appointment. 
Why noontide? Normally, ladies came to the well either in the morning or the evening, in the cool of the day. Cast your mind back to the story of um, Abraham sending his servant to find a wife for Isaac, and he went to the well. Do you remember? And uh, Rebecca came to the well. You all remember the story. Well, if you read that story, she came, as was the custom of the ladies, in the evening time. But this lady came at an unusual hour at noontime. Was it an accident that Jesus was there at exactly the right moment? And of course, we don't believe that. Have you seen in your life, can you remember in your life, and I can in mine, what we might call today some divine appointments? You know, I think that lady came for a reason. Maybe she'd been ostracized by the other ladies. Um, Sadrine alluded to this, that um, maybe that her lifestyle, and we're going to find that she'd had a number of husbands, maybe her lifestyle was one that had caused the others to reject her. Maybe she was sort of infamous in the area. Maybe she came because she wanted to come quietly, collect her water, go away and not be the source of gossip. Well, whatever the fact, Jesus was there at the well. Now he broke through custom. He broke through oh, many things. Uh, first of all, a Jew would not speak to a Samaritan. Secondly, a man would certainly not speak to a lady um, in public. And neither would a Jew share a cup with a Samaritan. Jimmy and Sadrine shared a cup together because they're husband and wife, of course, and that's absolutely fine, I think, even in our uh, lockdown situation. But at that time, Jews and Samaritans, because you would be unclean according to Jewish uh, custom and understanding. You know, Jews would not socialize or talk with Samaritans. They were allowed to do trade, and that's why the um, the disciples had gone into the town. But Jesus was there. And the lady came. And then we can begin to follow the story through from the Bible text. But what I want us to remember is that Jesus went out of his way to find the lady. It was a divine appointment. She didn't seek him. Jesus sought her. He came to save her. And that's still exactly the same to this day. Now, let's pick it up um, in, in the Bible text. I, I've got a Bible that has a red letter um, in it for the words of Jesus. So in verse 7, it says, A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me your drink, or will you give me a drink? And that started the conversation. And there you see a, a picture of how it may, may well have been. This was the sort of well uh, that there would have been in those days. Um, and there was the woman coming with the, um, the water pot on her head or on her shoulder. You won't find that today in Western countries, but some of you here will come from other countries where you will know this would still happen to this day. And there is Jesus sitting by the well. He's thirsty. But it's Jesus that initiates the conversation. And there again, you can pick it up. I've given you the text on the screen. But Jesus in verse 7 and said, give me a drink. And the woman begins to answer in between time. Uh, well, you're a Jew. How do you ask me for a drink? I'm a Samaritan woman. And and. Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Verse 10, Jesus answered her and said, if you knew the gift of God and who it was who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And we're beginning to have a dialogue that's going to go to and fro about water. But as Sadrine actually showed in her story, what Jesus wanted to share with her was not actually about physical water. You know, I don't actually know if Jesus even drank the water. I assume he did, but it doesn't say, does it? Did he drink the water? I don't know. But he wanted her to accept 
and drink the water of life as Serene shared. So there in verses 13 and 14, Jesus answers and says to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Thank you, Sadreen, for that. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst. But this water that I will give him will become in the fountain, become in him a fountain of water springing up into eternal life. We're talking about eternal life here. And Jesus was gently leading her along a path from something very simple to something so profound. And it's absolutely true to this day as well. Well, take away the well, take away the water pot. But we all still need to drink the water that will help us never thirst and give us eternal life. Now, in verse 15, these are not the words of Jesus, the words of the woman. She says to him, sir, give me this water that I, I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Now, we're going to come to a minute to where the conversation changes. And we're going to come to the discussion about her husband, her relationships, and about where they are. But I wanted to share a story. I've, I've put there in red, so I can remember it, messenger story. And this is up to date. Some of you will have received, in fact, I hope every family received through the mail quite recently a copy of the messenger Focus magazine and some other church um, documents. Did you receive them? The church has made it now a, a priority to make sure each one can receive um, these through the post. So at least for the next six months, that's going to happen. But if you want it to continue, you have to fill out a card and send it back. So make sure you actually do. But in that messenger, there is a story. And if I hold it up there, there's a story of a young couple. And it's under a section that says New Life in Christ. The title is Nervous Visitors Make Bristol Lodge Causeway Their Spiritual Home. Now, I've been to the Lodge Causeway Church many years ago when I was working in that district, actually, because my internship was done in Gloucester, which is literally just up the road, really. And this young lady who's writing the story, her name is Diania or Diana. And she writes the story. And I'm just going to read just very parts of it because it's going to show that the story of the woman at the well is so up to date. This is what she writes as I read. And I, I've underlined parts, so I'm, I'm praising it. Our story begins in the spring of 2019, a time when our lives seemed rosy but something in our souls was missing. And at first, I could not figure it out. I come to England, I was in a relationship that was a dream relationship. Uh, I had a job, I was traveling, I could do what I desired, she says. But I couldn't be with my family. I think she was from Romania, if I am correct. And then she says this, this was my life until one day my mum sent me a sermon to listen to. I had not listened to a sermon for a long time, even though I'd grown up as an Adventist. I left church when I was a teenager and forgot God. I tasted a cup of pleasure in the world, which at first seemed sweet, but in the end tasted bitter. After listening to the sermon, I realized how much I thirsted for the living water, her actual words. So she's quoting from this, um, this story, how much I thirsted for the living water our Lord Jesus Christ offers. And then she introduces her husband. She said her husband, Aidy, had grown up in the Orthodox Christian church, but he knew little about Jesus and the Bible. And so she said, after I'd listened to the sermon, I invited him to come and listen to the sermons too. And good old mum had obviously sent more sermons to them. And then she said, I shared with him what I knew about Jesus, about the truth, what the Bible has to say about the true day of rest as affirmed by Jesus and the Ten Commandments. I started sharing with him all that I knew from when I'd attended Sabbath school as a child. Isn't that wonderful? She could still remember uh, what she'd learned. Sabbath school teachers, what a great job you do. 
To her astonishment, she says, her husband, Adi, accepted the truth on the spot. And one day he said to me, and I am quoting, let's find an Adventist church here in Bristol. So there we were. She couldn't believe her ears. Her husband wanted to go to a church. They got dressed in, so this must have been before lockdown in uh, March 20. It must have been the end of 2019, early 2020, but right up to date. And they made their way and they found the local Adventist church. Now I know this has happened in both Creef and Dundee. I've heard you tell me stories about people who have just arrived at church one day. And first impressions are so important. She actually says in the story, when we arrived, we were nervous. We had no idea what to expect or how it would be. And she said the first person we met, and she gives a name, Tudor. He was friendly, kind, and approachable. And when he heard us talking to each other in Romanian, he said he was from Moldova and spoke the same language. Was that an accident? Or had God prepared that in advance? That those two on their very first day came to church and they didn't know what to expect. They could easily have been turned off. And God had provided the right person at the right time who spoke their language, who could welcome them and make them feel at home. And she said, in turn, many of the other members greeted us and invited us to return the next Sabbath. Lesson here, when we get visitors coming to the church, let's make sure, when we're back, of course, let's make sure they're welcome, they're greeted, they're made to feel at home. Because like this lady, she quickly became involved in the church, accepted. She completed a series where they did of Bible studies and they decided to get baptized. And she says how at first it was scheduled for uh, April 2020, but had to be um, postponed because of the pandemic. But finally, on the 19th of December, do you remember the churches were open for a time? 19th of December, the big day arrived and a day full of beauty and blessing. And then she ends, we want to praise our Lord Jesus Christ for bringing us to this point, for guiding our steps in the right path, for being by our side every time we needed him, for taking us out of the mire of sin, for loving us so much with an, end, uh, uh, sorry, with an everlasting love and for blessing us with heavenly blessings. Glory to God. That's an up-to-date story that is probably taken out of the same pages. And she quoted these words. She realized she needed the living water. So it just goes to show this story transcends time and place. Now the conversation goes on. Jesus wanted the lady to understand what salvation really meant and what this living water would help her, be, uh, how it would quest, quench her thirst forever. And he does it by asking her first of all, well, in verse 16, he says, Jesus said to her, um, go call your husband and come here. Now that's an interesting uh, statement. It could be fairly common. Um, he could have assumed she was of marriageable age and therefore would have a woman. But of course, Jesus knew. And the lady answered and said, I have no husband. And so the conversation goes on. Jesus says, you have well said I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. And I think the penny must have dropped at that moment. The lady must have realized this is no ordinary conversation. This is no ordinary man. And in fact, Jesus is going to tell her that I am he. I am the Messiah. And I wonder if you look back in your lifetime, in your experience, can you remember when the penny dropped that Jesus was active in your life and was reaching out to you when Jesus was going to change your life. It's individual to each of us, but it's just as true. Whether you grew up in the church or whether you came into the church from outside, as we say, 
with no church background, at some point, Jesus touched your life. Now there we have again another picture of uh, the woman handing Jesus uh, the water and Jesus accepting the water. Broke all conventions. But Jesus was moving through any religious uh, hatred or racial divide or social outcast because he knew the lady's background. And some would have said, you should not be there talking to this woman. But he was there for a purpose. And I like the picture, the way that they have, have done this. Look at the eyes, the way the artist has drawn. And the eyes of Jesus looking on the woman. And I can only believe that this was a look of acceptance, of understanding, of love. And Jesus was going to challenge her. There was going to be a confrontation, a conversation, a conversion, and a change life. But Jesus told her he knew the secrets of her life. And I guess at that moment she may have been scared. But the actual way that Jesus was talking to her and the way that his body language was and his words, she realized he was not condemning her. And you can remember, you can think of other stories. Of course, Jesus meeting the woman caught in adultery is another one where Jesus did not condemn her. But he did point out to her the error of her ways and that for conversion to happen, there needs to be a conviction of sin. Now, I began by saying that geography was important and it, it was. Jesus was there for a purpose. But actually, geography doesn't matter because the woman actually tried to deflect the conversation. And you'll find between, I think, verses 19 and 26, she said, oh, I see you're a prophet. And then she began to talk about the mountain that they worship on and the mountain that the Jews worship on. And Jesus listened kindly, but he wasn't deflected. And in the end, he began to tell her that, well, you know, you're going to worship in and we're going to worship in spirit and in truth. And Jesus finally tells her that I am he, I am the one, I am the Messiah. Because she said, we know uh, that the, the Messiah is coming. I'll just read verse 21, first of all. Jesus said, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem worship the Father. Your worship, you, uh, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. And then he goes down to verse 26, because the lady has said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. So that's the story. What a conversation. She would never have forgotten it. It moved from the simple to profound. It moved from just simply talking about water to talking about the fountain of life, of true conversion, living water. And it literally changed her life. I, I've got a statement there. It says the woman is converted between verses 26 and 27. You can't be sure, but if I read the uh, verses, in verse 26, Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. And then in verse 27, come the disciples. And the disciples come and begin to talk to him. But in verse 28, the woman then left her water pot, went away to the city, and said to the men, come and see. So at some point before that verse 28, she had changed her whole thinking, her whole understanding. She may not have understood everything, but she knew this man was different. And she rushed back. She wanted to go and tell others. And in the picture, and as I now begin to draw towards the end of this, you see her running back and talking and saying to the others, look, come and see. And what a fantastic word that was. 
come and see. I've met a man who's told me everything about me. Could this be the Christ? Is this the Messiah? Come and see. And you've moved down now in the, uh, the story to where Jesus actually um, does this. If I walk down to verse 39, many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He knew, he told me all that I ever did. And that's what happened. If you walk through verse 29, 30, and on to 39, that's what happened. She was so convinced and so convincing that they came out. Now, I think they knew her. She may have been ostracized. She may have been a woman of ill repute, as we use this word. And yet, I think they saw something in her face. I can't be sure it doesn't say, but certainly in her voice, in her face, they knew something had happened. And you know, when people meet Jesus, this often happens. You can see in them that they've changed. Read Ellen White's conversion story at the uh, the start of the Testimonies, Testimony Volume 1, you'll get the story of her biography of what happened and how she went down and she went to a camp meeting and went to the front. And when she came out, one of the ladies who called the Sisters in Zion or Sisters in Israel said to her, have you met the Christ? Have you met Christ? And then she said, yes, you have. I can see it in your face. I like the story of the great preacher Spurgeon who went to, uh, in a, a uh, winter period when there was great snow ended up in a, a chapel somewhere and an old preacher was preaching and he found a message that made him look to Jesus and when he got home his mum said to him if you read his biography something's happened you're different well I think that's what happened to this lady she was different and she went out and told the others, and she was so convincing, they could see what had happened. Many of the Samaritans of the city believed, and they came to hear Jesus. And we will find that Jesus actually stayed two extra days. He didn't hurry through Samaria. He stayed there. In fact, he'd come from Judea, where he'd had very little success, if you like, because the Pharisees were always after him on his case but he came to Samaria where basically he was going into uncharted territory and the people of a different um, country a different region let me say who weren't from the Jewish religion they accepted him but it doesn't end there does it of course because in verse 42 you get to the end point where we uh, read that many of the Samaritans came out to listen to Jesus. And then in verse 42 or 41, many more believed because of his own word. And in verse 42, and they said to the woman, now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him. And we know that this is indeed the Christ, the saviour of the world. I made a note there, if you can see on the screen. In verse 10, it says, or Jesus was saying, if you knew who this was. And in verse 42, you get the same um, uh, understanding coming back. Now we know. Knowing makes all the difference, but it's accepting. The story shows the enduring power of the gospel message. It was true then. It's true now. And I believe Jesus has gone out of his way to make sure that we have heard the gospel message. Oh, there's so much that we could unpack if there was time. Jesus is wanting us to go out and just share a simple testimony. All that Jesus said is, come and see. I've met a man. Come and see for yourselves. Could this be the Christ? A simple testimony. And I think you have probably had that experience where you've had the opportunity to do the same. The story I shared from the, um, the messenger, the last messenger, shows that it's still happening today. 
it still happens to young and old. And I know there have been some young people with us. I don't know if you're still with us, but young people like that young lady in Bristol studied and was baptized. I pray that that will be the experience for many of you very soon. I know Grief and Dundee have a wonderful group of young people growing now, very important to the church, their mums and dads, and growing in their knowledge and understanding. And I think Jesus is still offering living water to each and every one. It changed their lives. It changed her life. You know, I've never forgotten that meeting with that boss. Right mental attitude. I pray for each of us that we will have the right mental attitude, which in this case is listening to the words of Jesus, accepting Jesus in our hearts, making something that will change us. You know, was it uh, one of the Wesleys, John Wesley, who said when he came to a meeting, Aldergate Street, I think, that his heart was strangely warmed. May our hearts this Sabbath be strangely warmed because we meet with Jesus. Conversations with Jesus, you never forget them. May they change your life and may they change mine. Let's have a word of prayer before I think we're going to have a, um, a, a song from Steve and Carol. But let me just pray and we'll have a benediction to close. Dear Lord, I thank you for this story because it's a powerful story. It's a true story. It's a living story. Jesus' words changed lives. They did then, they do now. And as we have heard the story from Bristol, how they changed Diana and her husband, Adi. Lord, may we go out and tell others of what Jesus means to us and just invite him to come and see us because I am convinced to see you. I'm convinced during this lockdown, there are so many who have questions that they want to have answered and people who know there are things bigger than they are. And I believe at the end of this lockdown, we too may see people coming to know Jesus because they have felt their hearts strangely warmed. Give us this living water. And Lord, although we don't need to thirst anymore, may we keep searching, may we keep drinking, may we keep being close to you, our Lord and Saviour. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father. Amen. Now, if I stop the share. Thank you, Paul. There we are. Wonderful. And I'm just removing the spotlight from Paul there. We say thank you for that. I'm going to find the song for us. Is it going to let me know. Okay, this is. Never sure I'm dry. Fill my 
Thank you, Paul. You can do the benediction now. Yes, and I'd like to thank Carol, and um, thank you so much. That was beautiful, and uh, we've done it short notice, and thank you for doing that, Steve. I'm sure you heard the words. Help her, uh, maybe held the words, but thank you so much indeed. Fill my cup, Lord. Lift it up, Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for those words that are timeless. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Fill my cup and make me whole. Lord, bless each one. For the members of Dundee, Creef, old and young, I pray that you will be so close to us. Lord, may we truly lift our cup to you. May you change our lives each and every day. May we walk beside you. And Lord, may we have opportunity this coming week. Maybe it's only through the internet or over the phone, but may we have the opportunity of telling somebody about the man Jesus that we have met, who's changed our lives. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much for um, doing the service today and reminding us so well uh, that this story is by no means old and by no means ancient and that it can happen with all of us even today. So we really do appreciate that. Um, I just want to say that next week we have Pastor Bob Rod, and Pastor Bob is going to uh, uh, to still venture, I think, in Chapter 4, um, and uh, he's going to be sharing a little bit with... In fact, he's going to be venturing in Chapter 3 of John, um, where he will be telling us a little bit about uh, water into wine. So, Pastor Bob, we're looking forward to you next week. And, um, and uh, we're very happy that uh, 